get us started. Um, well, first of all, welcome everyone to the first session of a four-part Louisiana Redistricting Summit virtual series. Thank you for joining us today and thank you too to Fair Districts Louisiana, our co-hosts. My name is Dr. Janae Slocum and I'm the director of LSU's Riley Center for Media and Public Affairs at the Manship School of Mass Communication. At the Riley Center, we're dedicated to exploring important contemporary public policy issues affecting our state and beyond. And redistricting is certainly one of those. And because the process is not a frequent one, it's important that we have programs like this one where Louisiana residents can learn about the process and understand the components at play. This morning's program will be broken up into two panels. In the first panel, our guests, uh, Barry Irwin, President and CEO of the Council for <laughs> Louisiana, Ashley Shelton, Executive Director of the Power Coalition for Equity and Justice, and former State Senator Norby Schraber will discuss several of the most important issues that will come into play during redistricting. In the second panel, State Representatives Royce DuPlessis and Barry Ivey will be joined by Louisiana's Commissioner of Administration, Jay Darden. They will look ahead to con congressional redistricting. That panel will be moderated by former State Representative Melissa Flournoy. In between the two panels, we'll hear from Stephen Kearney, co-director of Hair Districts Louisiana, who's gonna do a short presentation on redistricting mapping technology and best practices, and then you too will be able to map districts. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping points. First, we have everyone muted except for our speakers. If you have questions, please submit those using the chat function down at the lower, or rather the bottom of your screen. Um, both of our panels are pretty packed, but we're gonna try to get in at least one audience question into to each panel. And I'll be moderating the first one on issues at play. So Ashley, Barry, and Norby, um, why don't we start off with introductions? When I call on you, please share a little bit about your personal and professional backgrounds, as well as your experience with redistricting. And Ashley, why don't we kick off with you? Sure. Good morning. My name is Ashley Shelton. I am, um, you know, I recently, my title changed. I'm actually the president and CEO, founder president and CEO of uh, the Power Coalition for Equity and Justice. And we are um, the civic engagement table for the state. So we work across the state to ensure that infrequent voters of color are actually engaging in all of these political processes, whether it's voting, whether it's census, whether it's getting out education and information about COVID-19, but just ensuring that community is actually engaging in in the electoral process at every level, um, as well as um, we do a lot of deep listening and do listening sessions across the state that then drives uh, what we call the people's agenda. And so we do a lot of advocacy work as well. Um, you know, this will be my second redistricting, um, you know, you know, experience. And so I was very involved, worked with Melissa and many of the other faces on the, um, many of other folks on the, on the line today, um, you know, just fighting for equity within our redistricting process. And uh, look forward to this conversation because, um, you know, this will be the first time we're doing it without Section 5 in place. And so I think that there's some real implications that we've got to discuss. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Barry. Hey, well, good morning. Uh, I'm Barry Irwin. I'm president of the Council for Better Louisiana. Uh, we're a statewide nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. It's been around since uh, the early 1960s, um, working on a variety of issues, uh, mostly things uh, dealing with uh, public education, uh, state fiscal policies, which we'll be talking a lot about during the uh, upcoming legislative session, governmental ethics, those types of things. Uh, but we're just interested in, in a lot of areas of quote unquote, I guess you would say good government. We're not actively involved in the redistrict, dis, uh, redistricting process. Uh, we've certainly been observers. We do advocate for a, a fair, open process, and we'll, we'll probably talk about that a little bit here. Um, you know, my experience with redistricting goes back, I don't even want to say how long. Um, I used to be a reporter, and, uh, you know, covering redistricting as a reporter in those days was very difficult because it was all done behind the scenes. Uh, there was not the technology and the access to things that we have now. It's really changed from day to night over the years. And, and, and actually the redistricting uh, process that we're going to go through this year is probably the most um, 
techno technologically friendly one that, that we've ever had before, and that'll probably only continue. But um, we're here just to um, kind of kind of help, you know, maybe set some ground rules that we hope the legislature and uh, others would follow in terms of transparency and openness. So that's kind of where we're from. Okay, Norby. Uh, bonjour, mes amis. Je m'appelle Norbert Chabert, but y'all can call me Norby. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> former three-term state senator, and uh, probably the most interesting aspect about my term um, was I was elected in a special in 2009 when my predecessor, um, Senator Reggie Dupre, uh, applied for and was blessed and lucky enough to receive uh, permission to take over our, our levy district. If you remember, in 2008, we had a terrible storm season that saw my region of Terrebonne and Lafouche hit by two massive hurricanes, Gustav and Ike. Uh, that led to a um, summertime primary uh, and a general election going into the fall that I won and began serving in 2010, which was the census year. Uh, I shared at the time the way the districts were drawn. I shared LaFouche Parish with President of the Senate, Joel Chasson, and he said, listen, uh, I don't have spaces on Senate and governmental affairs for you. But in the Senate, we have this unique rule of interim membership where you can participate on the committee uh, and have full access, but you actually don't get a vote during the session. So he says, listen, I'm going to put you on Senate and governmental as an interim member, and uh, that'll afford you complete compliance. Because not only at that time were we going to have to deal with the um, repercussions of the diaspora of African-American population uh, both in the House and the Senate, and moving and relocating uh, the minority majority Senate district from New Orleans that we all kind of assumed was going to be along the river. Well, that would come down and impact Lafouche Parish. He said that's going to be important. There's a chance that Lafouche may have up to three senators. It wound up with four. That's a story we can get into another time. I was the fourth. Um, but he also said, listen, the major issue we're going to have that's gonna be above all is going to be the fact that we're gonna lose a congressional district. And that congressional district was the old, you know, I like to call it the Tozan third that at the time had been um, occupied by Jeff Landry. That, that district was eliminated as we all know, and we came down from seven to six. And uh, so I was, I was <laughs> but a year in the Senate and had to deal with the BP all spill in, in 10, with the trailer special session of redistricting that would impact not only my Senate district greatly, uh, but our whole region from the congressional uh, standpoint. So uh, it allowed me a lot of in real behind the scenes and inside the rails uh, aspects to um, read the whole redistricting process. And to say it was a baptism by fire is an understatement. So happy to be with y'all once again. Well, thank you. I'm so happy that all of you have joined us. Um, and thank you for those introductions. Um, you know, you mentioned, I think it was Barry, you mentioned the, um, the fact that typically we start this process off with a census that happens in a year ending in zero. And then the next year, usually early or mid year is when states tend to do their actual redistricting. And due to the pandemic, our census data is going to be a bit late. And given that we're off cycle, um, you know, I'd like to throw this out there for everyone. What kind of timeline can we anticipate? Um, you know, why don't we, I'll, I'll just throw it out there. Ashley, Barry, Norby, you know, what, what do you, what are we, what should we expect going forward? Ladies well, I'll just. <laughs> I'll just go real quickly. Um, you know, it is a, a delay time frame. I mean, last we're hearing is, you know, getting the real hard numbers uh, by September 30th. That's pretty late in the process, particularly when we're talking about our congressional races and our congressional, um, you know, redistricting where those races are going to start next year. So it's going to throw things, you know, really out of whack. I haven't heard exactly what timing people want to choose for like the legislative pieces and all. It appears that our constitution allows for us to, uh, to do the redistrict in the legislature the year following that we get the uh, get the data so that that could delay that into 2022 if they choose to but um, I think it'll be a kind of a tight frame a tight time frame to try and get going for the uh, congressional redistrict and, and we'll see how that goes okay no and I agree Barry and I think you know 
you know, one of the things that, you know, as somebody that tries to do turnout for elections and ensuring that, you know, folks that exercise their voice and their vote and their power, um, you know, it, it also too, you know, thinking about the timeline and thinking about going into 2022, hoping that we don't end up with a situation where we've got folks that are being elected on old maps and then having to do real, you know, doing additional like new elections once new maps are drawn feels, um, if you, I'm already tired and it hasn't even mm -hmm. happened yet. So, um, I mean, and so I think that, you know, you, the timeline you, um, you've just talked about is the one that we've heard as well. And, um, and we're just worried about, you know, like, will the, you know, are hopeful that the legislature will have the will that once we do get those numbers, um, um, you know, we may not be able to, you know, um, do it, you know, quickly enough for congressional, but that we should definitely try to push to make sure that the legislative, um, you know, that the legislative districts can be drawn in a timely manner once we have the data. Yeah, um, it's certainly going to be a, a, an unprecedented situation we find ourselves in. I keep hearing that it'll be sometime uh, in between the iconic Louisiana holidays of DC Mardi Gras and regular Mardi Gras, which, um, you know, will be interesting. Unlike previous, the, the, the previous round of redistricting, it doesn't look like we're gonna lose a congressional seat uh, that may be by, uh, you know, a hair of a margin. Um, the section five aspect of things as Ashley mentioned earlier is really going to be um, an interesting uh, situation to observe. Um, you know, Louisiana has held for a very long time uh, a pretty nonpartisan sort of uh, way of doing business while the rest of the country became more polarized. Over the last 10 years, that has greatly changed, as we all know. So it'll be interesting to see how uh, the respective parties in place uh, with the leadership uh, of uh, two houses that are GOP controlled, um, if they really stay to the you handle your chamber, I'll handle my chamber, we'll do congressional together um, sort of template that we've seen in the past or it completely changes. Well, could somebody share just a little bit about section five? Uh, Ashley, you wanna take that because I need to pause my video for two seconds while I replug in my <laughs> <laughs> no worries. I'm happy to talk about it. So, um, you know, so there was a Supreme Court case um, that where basically they removed Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. And what Section 5 did was for states that um, had 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 problems um, submitting maps that were not racist um, or that um, in particular muted the voices of people of color in their states, uh, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, uh, for example, um, you know, like that they had to have their maps pre-cleared, meaning that someone else was able to review those maps to ensure that they indeed met a certain standard um, of inclusion, um, you know, and certainly the you know, the, you know, kind of the three, you know, things that we look at in redistricting, you know, which is con, con, con I, I always want to, it's like the word is con, contiguity, compactness, and communities of interest. And so, um, and so section five no longer exists. And so, you know, I think one of the things that is really powerful about the moment of this particular cycle of redistricting um, is that, you know, we have to remember that, you know, regardless of the party of the House and the Senate, uh, or the who could controls the House and the Senate, that we have a state that's 32% African-American, you know, 5.5% other. So 38% of the state is now so much more diverse. And so I do think that, um, you know, that we have to consider even without Section 5, we all, um, you know, we all have a responsibility to ensure that we are making sure that people have voice and representation in our state. Um, and, I, you know, some of us are worried because we've never had to not go through the pre-clearance process. Um, and so this will be the first time. And I think, you know, there are lots of us that are hoping that there is lots of transparency, equity, um, and voice in the process. And so, you know, to date, we've trained over 200 folks across the state to be able to engage in the process using a multitude of different, um, you know, uh, software. So whether it's Dave's, you know, redistricting tool, or um, there's a great, you know, tool that we're also using out of Tufts University. Um, we've got, you know, kind of a, a demographer that we've been working with who's, you know, defended maps and worked on a lot of the stuff in North Carolina, who has also been supporting and providing support to groups on the ground um, here 
in Louisiana, Tony Fairfax, to kind who has, you know, you know, he's won, you know, he's won several U.S. Supreme Court cases of around redistricting from the perspective of, you know, are we being inclusive of all of the people in community and do they truly have their fair representation? Thank you for sharing that, Ashley. Um, well, certainly that's my take on it. I mean, yeah, certainly my take on it. I mean, I think that, there, you know, so, you know, I think, um, you know, certainly folks have some other thoughts, but I mean, I think that that is, um, that that's the genesis of the law and what we are going to have to confront, um, you know, is that we're doing it for the first time ourselves. And can we meet the, you know, can we meet that test of, um, you know, of equity um, without having the federal government do it for us? Well, given, and, you know, I would, I would just say to follow up, I mean, Ashley's exactly right. That, that, part of the Voting Rights Act was, was really a guardrail for the legislature in advance. So you, you knew it was there. As you went through all the, the machinations and the political piece, that was always looming there. Now that that guardrail is gone, the law is still there in terms of what we can't you know, dilute minority uh, voting representation and, and discriminate and all that, but it's just a different process. But that guardrail was there and I think it helped, you know, even though we still, um, you know, litigated a lot of the, the districts or had challenges uh, to some of the ways that a lot of things were, were written. It, it was a, a very positive guardrail that, that had people's attention at the front end. It's gonna be very interesting to see if that, that, that immediate, you know, um, awareness that people had back in those days uh, will exist with the, with the legislature right now. Um, yeah, it's gonna be interesting to see. Well, given that we're talking about how this process is, is changing, you know, each one of you has been through at least one, uh, if not more, redistricting um, cycles. What issues, lessons, or events stand out for you um, from those experiences that can be instructive and applicable? I know, Barry, you had mentioned that you, you know, watched this process when everything was kind of done behind doors. You know, could you kick us off with that and just share how that's changed over the decades? Yeah, I mean, it's been a, a profound change. I mean, the technology has just changed everything. Uh, in the days when I was first down there, you had a couple of people who were, you know, probably super experts of the of the legislative, of the House and Senate staff um, that were really sort of the gurus of the numbers and how to, to work all these things. And they had to do it uh, with without the kind of computer stuff that we have now, without the accessibility, you had to wait to get data. It was so much more difficult to change maps. So you get a map and people say, oh, I got a problem here, a problem there. Right now we can just go push a button and you switch it and you can see all the different ripple effects and you can see the effect it has. It wasn't that way now. So we're really in a much, much better place now than we were then in terms of technology. I think the other thing that, that um, is an observation I guess I would make. I, I think the last time we went through the redistricting process 10 years ago um, was probably the most transparent um, uh, redistricting process that we had had before then. It was just so opaque before that. And, you know, I credit some of the leadership that we had in the legislature at that time in trying to do that. They actually did have some rules in terms of at least some principles that they were trying to abide by. We could, we could argue whether they went far enough in their principles, but they were, you know, principles that they had established at the forefront. They did do some public hearings and, and there was, you know, more access to the public than I had ever seen before. Um, the hope is that building upon that experience of 10 years ago and the technology and you know, the new faces and, and different folks that are in there, that we can kind of start at the outset with a big you know, notion of transparency. These are what our principles are. This is what we, our, our guidance wants to be. And we wanna make it open to everybody. And you know, Ashley was talking earlier about you know, the, the deadlines and the trickiness now because of the late um, you know, arrival of the data. You know, there's going to be a tendency, I think, to try and rush this or to get this through as fast as we can because the deadlines are going to be such. But, you know, I, I think we can move fast without overly rushing. And I guess my hope would be that we don't overly rush it because we don't want to have the perception that this is somehow a closed process, that it's not open to everybody. Uh, we want everybody to have time to look at these maps, to review them, to submit their own maps if they have some available. And, and you know, we're going to live with these districts for 10 years, theoretically, and we need to get them right. And we need to have the, the confidence and credibility, uh, you know, of the public. Um, uh, otherwise, we just continue to, you know, kind of deteriorate, you know, confidence in government. Well, you know, yeah. sorry. I was just going to talk a little bit about that. You know, one of the things that that we're sort of buoyed by is that 
the remaining um, institutional knowledge that we have in the respective chambers and, and, and at the Capitol uh, in the forms of folks like Trish Lowry, you know, Yolanda Dixon, who is now the Secretary of the Senate, I mean, very much a guru uh, of, of wars past. And it, it, it's like Barry said, you never saw a more transparent redistricting process take place in the state. One, from a storyline standpoint, you know, you could really see a sea change in public uh, availability to just what's going on via Twitter and Facebook and all these other social media platforms. So storylines like losing a congressional district was selling papers, you know, for our media outlets. And the reporters that were covering were really digging into these subplots that, that were going on. I think that's going to be amplified times 10, even though I don't believe we're going to have the drama, so to speak, of the, um, the loss of a congressional district. And at the end of the day, you know, we, we can't lose sight of the fact that, look, the numbers are going to be what the numbers are going to be. And, you know, often from a, from a legislative standpoint, the lines are just going to move a precinct or two or three over, you know, unless something drastic changes where there's just a gluttonous uh, party power grab on one side or the other to make super majority districts in certain places. You'll see a little ebb and flow uh, from, from the legislative standpoint, but for the most part, like Barry was saying, you gotta keep it between the lines and it's just gonna be some, hey, I'll trade you this precinct. They were never really, you know, uh, uh, had much commonality, commonality with one side of my district. I think it'll benefit you. And, and you'll see that across the state from Shreveport all the way down to Chauvin. And then one one quick thing that I I mean that I'd add as well is that you know I think that there's you know certainly you know the last time you know that there was transparency but I do think that we still fight though for you know I mean to Norrie's point for for equity and um and you know you've got community I think this time around that's going to be much more involved both at, at the district level so like working directly with their elected officials um, submitting their own maps I mean I think that this idea of communities of interest is really gaining um, its own space in this conversation of what it means to draw maps like this idea of like you know communities of interest beyond race but then like but what do we, you know whether it's you know fishing communities whether it's about education and charter versus public I mean you know like there are all these other things that I think we have to think about and then you know I remind folks of this all the time too that you know at this point you know I used to you know we have a brand new legislature so due to term limits you know our legislature for the most part hasn't done redistricting so there's what a handful of folks from, you know, on the House and the Senate side that have ever gone through the process. And so, you know, we also have a lot of new folks that will be experiencing this for the first time. And so I think that there's a lot of education um, that also has to happen, you know, with our legislative body. And then I think the last thought that I, I would love to add too is that we know that the state is blacker and browner than it's been. Um, you know, I can't speak for the foster gain population, but I, I, I do know it's blacker and browner. And, and for example, places like Jefferson Parish has had an explosion of both um, Latinx and African-American um, citizens moving into the parish. Bossier, you know, Bossier Parish is also, you know, um, has gained a lot of, um, you know, black population. Um, St. Bernard Parish, which, you know, by law was mostly, uh, was mostly white for a long time until after Katrina and the lawsuits that forced that community um, to, to expand. And now St. Bernard Parish has a, a burgeoning, growing Black community. And so what does that mean about you know, all of a sudden, you know, like precincts and, you know, like all of a sudden the conversation is just a little bit different because you've got, um, you know, growing, you know, growing communities of color all across the state in places that, um, you know, certainly were, you know, had some, um, you know, had some diversity in the first place like Jefferson, but we've seen an, a huge influx um, from, you know, the last redistricting process to the current. Well, and so, you know, given what you all just said, I want to quickly touch on, you um, you know, transparency and how we, we do our best to, to guarantee that and guarantee participation in the process. And then we're gonna jump to talking about some of those uh, population shifts since 2010. So, you know, you touched on um, the fact that our legislature is, is turned over. So a lot of that institutional knowledge of elected officials won't be there. We do thankfully have some, some really um, knowledgeable and experienced staff but you know, it's still a lot fewer people. And then also since 2010, since I'm coming from a media perspective over here at the Manship School, um, you know, there are fewer 
folks reporting on all of this. And so, you know, Norby, you talked about how part of the transparency of that process was that it was getting tweeted out. We had social media involved in it uh, far more than we would have had 10 years before. So, you know, with those things in mind, how, how do we ensure transparency and public participation? Well, I'll say this, you know, it, it, it's not lost on my story that I kind of grew up around the Capitol and having my father serve uh, so long ago. And, I, you know, people, when I first got elected, they were like, what is the biggest difference between those days and this days? I said, it's very, very simple. In those days, they recorded nothing. In these days, they record everything. <laughs> so, you know, one of the great things that, that we do in terms specifically of the redistricting uh, is we, we kind of follow that joint transportation roadshow model where we're go where the the respective transportation committees will go across the state and visit the DOTD districts, meeting with community stakeholders, meeting with the population and saying, hey, what are your infrastructure priorities? We do that in redistricting, you know, to, to ensure that we're talking, we're, you know, you're getting face to face with not only the economic and socioeconomic sectors and, and you know, the, the, the cultures of the respective people, because commonality quite often is more, con, you know, the contiguous aspect, even though you have to keep it. That seems to be more important uh, than anything. The, the involvement that you get from an interesting storyline, you know, I don't know if uh, we'll see that type of involvement from just lay persons to the political process that may be really, really concerned for losing representation um, or seeing dramatic, you know, multi-generational shifts. Like, wow, you know, we, we're losing a congressman that we had uh, for, for 25 years. You're not gonna necessarily see that. So it'll be interesting to see how community groups and, um, you know, interested uh, parties of, of, of all political persuasions kind of put their own spin and their advocacy on it. I, I will say this. The, the biggest subplot to me, I think, uh, uh, and it's a, a tad off topic, but is, is going to be the continuous elongation of the two northern congressional districts. And a lot of the, you know, black and brown sort of shift that Ashley was pointing to last term really led to, look, we've got six districts. The third, a third of the state is, is you know, black, and brown, minority. You just do the simple math and you say, okay, one of these is going to be majority majority. We may not be able to draw another minor majority minority district, but you're certainly going to draw a more competitive district. And it took a lot of wrangling to ensure that you didn't see that last go round. Uh, I'm going to take this as a point of pride uh, where I assisted Senator Lydia Jackson uh, getting, I believe it was three plans out of the Senate that ensured that we were going to have a more competitive North Louisiana district. Uh, a lot of that was self-interest because it kept Terrebonne and Lafouche combined. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, those, uh, despite the best efforts by my good friend and now President Rick Gallo, who was serving as House and Government Affairs Chair at the time, um, he was only able to get one of those bills in front of the committee and we walked in with the votes and lost the vote. There was yeah. some, some serious flipping and wrangling going on in that committee. So it'll be, you know, never lose sight of the fact that this is politics at the highest level and it's hardball, y'all. Yeah, no, and Norby, remember, I mean, I, you know, one of the, I think that was one of the most contentious House uh, committee meetings. meetings I'd ever been in. Remember they turned Lydia, they wouldn't even unmute. Yeah, they wouldn't even, unmute Lydia's mic. I said, what is happening? It was, it was quite the, um, you know, like quite the moment, like this is supposed to be a very calm, you know, um, you know, maybe a little festive at times, um, a little spicy at times, but at the most part, it's redistricting. It's not the yeah. sexiest thing, but that particular committee meeting, I felt like, um, I was just like, 
<laughs> what is happening? This is insane. But, but you know, but I do think, um, you know, one thing I did want to comment on, um, you know, Norby, uh, that I think is important for folks to think about is that I think that, we, you know, like there is this big looming question, will we be able to get another minority majority district um, at the congressional level? And I think that, you know, you know, we've got congressional district two, that's Baton Rouge, the River Parishes, New Orleans. I think that there are certainly some strong feelings about, you know, folks in the River Parishes feel like they don't, you know, like that they need more voice and representation. Um, you know, there's always this epic kind of battle between Baton, Baton Rouge and New Orleans. Um, and But I think that Jefferson and New Orleans actually may create an opportunity for a second congressional district that then leaves Baton Rouge or maybe the River Parishes to kind of think about what what that means and what that you know like what that what that could mean for them and then I think one thing that I would like to say that we have been overwhelmed and and you know beautifully surprised by is that we've done these crowd academies and they teach folks everything from A to Z on redistricting regular everyday folks elected folks um, you know like how does redistricting work what are the what are the percentages you know like I can tell you you know, um, how much representation any, any group of folks has from any particular perspective of that, you know, Congressional House, Senate, um, Bessie, school boards um, across the state. And so in these crowd academies, again, I've, we've already trained over 200 folks. And then we had to do another one because there's so much interest on the on the ground and community for folks that want to get engaged in this process. Because I think, you know, people get it now that, you know, I, you know, always, you know, Melissa and Sarah, folks have heard me say this voting is a social determinant of health like folks get that their these elections determine in the quality of their life in ways that they never really felt or understood before and so i think that you know we were only we were only going to do one crowd academy and here we are you know going into may um with our third crowd academy and we already have a waiting list um and, and and it's over 100 people. So I do think that we're going to see much more, you know, citizen engagement, because I think that folks um, are starting to understand more and more what is the truth me have representation. So I'm, I'm hopeful that 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 will add a different layer to um, to the conversation and help, you know, and help you know, legislators themselves that have never done this before understand what it means for, you know, a, you know, one, one neighborhood right next to the next neighborhood not being in the same district and how that impacts them. And so I think um, I'm excited to kind of see how that, you know, that that plays out to have more citizen engagement, but I've been very blown away by um, the amount of outreach and interest that's been um, pouring out for, you know, education about redistricting this year. I'll tell you a quick story about that, that um, governmental affairs, meeting to show you that never forget this is pure politics right i mean raw unadulterated really really political nerd stuff <laughs> as we kept winning these victories uh to to have that um competitive district in north louisiana it was a little more compressed not so elongated it was a big story and it was interesting to see lydia jackson all the way up there in shreveport norby shaber all the way down to buy in in, in homa you know, sort of combining uh, to to make this happen. And, you know, it's uh, Lydia is a great friend, and it'll be interesting to see how the new members from from North Louisiana tackle. I know Senator Milligan uh, on on that side, and several others are going to have to deal with the fact that there's only one one Wiley Fox left from up there, and that's Senator <laughs> Farber. He plays Good definitely time. into this story. So as we kept winning these victories, and Lydia Jackson and me embracing and hugging and and high fiving Yvonne Dorsey, you know, as we keep passing these bills that were fated to not get hearings in the house <laughs> you know we're making the front page of the the, the advocate and the picky unit at the time and, and so on and so forth and we must have gotten three incredible political photos out of that well here we go fast forward to the losing effort and i was sitting right behind lydia in that committee and she turns and she shakes my hand and i'm stretched out like this shaking her hand and that's the front page senate effort for north louisiana district fails uh, in contentious house meeting or, or whatever the, the headline was. Fast forward to the next election year. My good friend who I've known my whole life, Gregory Tarva, takes said picture, superimposes Governor Jindal's face on mine and <laughs> uses it in a mail piece against Senator Jackson and says, this is how close Lydia Jackson and Bobby Jindal are. We need a change. Vote Greg Tarpa. And it made the news. And, you know, I can't recall the call signs for the, the media stations up there, but they were calling me down. They're like, Senator, how does it feel to be injected into this contentious center race? I'm like, these people are both my friends. I ain't saying nothing. <laughs> 
you know, may the best person win. But yeah, never forget raw politics. Yes, <laughs> thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, we only have time for one more question. We've got about five minutes. Um, you know, you guys have mentioned some of these underlying principles and ideas behind redistricting, like uh, competitiveness. And Ashley, I'm going to struggle with this too. Con contiguity and communities of interest and more. Um, what do you think it's important for the public to understand about those concepts? Sure. So, I mean, I think, you know, kind of, kind of you is looking at, you know, we can't, the, the districts can't jump from place to place. And so it shouldn't be that, you know, like a district skips over areas that are, you know, can continue connected right and so that you know like so that one's a, a an easy thing we certainly see in some of the northern districts that you know you know there's some issues where you can certainly get around some of the contiguity issues you know compactness is the other which is you know districts shouldn't be drawn in extremely odd shapes um and so this this idea that you know that a district should you know it, it should be compact it should be um you know it should have folks that have similar interests which goes into the communities of interest you know like so districts should try to keep populations that share you know interests together and i think that you know for a long time that is you know that 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 particular piece um, has been used, you know, around race and, you know, and making sure that, you know, we didn't have issues where, you know, like the, the voices of black and brown people were being neutered in, in, in the process. Um, but I think that, you know, I think actually in our state, sometimes we've gone a little too far. I mean, it doesn't make sense for us to have a 99, you know, a 90% black or white district. And so, you know, um, Steve Kearney, um, you know, Melissa Flournoy and, and myself and many others have been fighting for this idea of, you know, like there shouldn't, you know, like, 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 let's put some fair redistricting principles out there that, you know, no district should be 60% more white, you know, 60% or more white or black, which then gives you more competitive districts. Um, you know, like thinking about like, what are those principles? And we've even been trying to work with the governor's office to get him to actually just, you know, sign, you know, like to sign a letter, a legal letter that just says that, you know, hey, I'm, you you know, if, if maps don't meet certain criteria, you know, that, you know, he will use his veto power, you know, I mean, and, and not that, you know, certainly the legislature, you know, could go back and then, uh, you know, overturn that. But I think the idea is to just signal that, um, you know, that we do want a fair and open process. And so, when you look at these, um, you know, like these kind of basic, you know, three principles, um, you know, it becomes really critical to kind of think about how, you know, like our current maps, you know, like, again, you know, when you think about contiguity, when I think about District 2, you know, again, I mean, I, we do a lot of work in the river parishes, they do feel disconnected from, um, you know, like their, their issues and their realities are very different from a Baton Rouge or New Orleans. Um, and so how are we making sure that they actually have voice, right? And so um, they don't have enough power to you know to you know to unelect you know like to to choose truly who runs that district um you know and so it just you know it becomes an issue and so i just say you know again you know we're going to be looking at um in particular this time communities of interest and looking beyond just race but also the issues and the things that people care about um you know and then also too making sure that as 38 percent of the 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 state at this point is black and brown um, and certainly Asian Pacific Islander, um, you know, certainly New Orleans uh, growing population in Baton Rouge, certainly in our river parishes as well. Um, how are we making sure that their voices are included in this process and that we're not creating these, you know, you know, these mega districts of, you know, large percentages of African-American or white or, or other that at the end of the day, like we have to live in communities together. We wanna to have competitive elections so that folks actually feel like they have representation. Barry and Norby, would you like to add to that? We've got about one minute. I'll go very fast. Um, now, I, I agree with what Ashley was saying. I think one of the things that's so tricky about this is that sometimes you know, these values and these principles can be conflicting. I mean, we can have a compact district, but it might break up communities of interest and we can have communities of interest uh, as, as a big uh, important thing, but, but maybe it makes a district less competitive. So we need to find a way to blend those things and, and make sure that what we get is the outcome that we want, because you can sort of twist those, you know, just because of the way things can work when you, you're starting to look at lines. The last thing I would say is you mentioned transparency. 
I think it's really incumbent upon groups like ours and all of ours to talk to these legislators in the front end and talk about these values and talk about these principles, especially since there are so many new folks in there. Um, you know, they're, they're coming from a fresh slate, a lot of them, um, and, and we need to introduce ourselves on these issues to them in advance of whenever they meet in this special session to do the redistricting. Yeah, and, and I'll go quickly on three things. First, you know, this is going to be our second go round with the, the overbearingness of, of term limits, right? So that inherent protection of my political turf thing that existed prior to that isn't there, though it still is. You know, the second thing is that people need to remember it, it's not drawn based on voter pop, right? It's based on souls, so to speak. It's about how many people are there, not how many voters are there. So when you're drawing the districts, it, it's not necessarily, let me get so much Democrat vote or Republican vote or independent vote or what happened. It's, okay, what, what, how many people can we get in, actual people in these lines? And, you know, the contiguity, contiguousness aspect of it is complicated in, in South Louisiana just because all of the bodies of water that we have to deal with. And people don't know this, but the contiguousness can jump the water. So that's another thing. And, you know, finally, I'll just say this. Despite the best efforts of a lot of self-interested groups, sometimes you have to pick, you have to protect populations from themselves because it's a chess match and not a checkers game. I'll use the example of North Lafouche, for example. Thibodeau, they really, really, really felt they wanted one senator. We want a senator, a senator. And it's worked out very good for them to have four because, you know, I didn't graduate from the Wharton School of Finance, but I do know that four votes in the Senate is better than one, but you didn't hear that from me. <laughs> no, and I, and I think, Norby, that's a perfect example too of like, well, if they have four, then that means that there's certainly other communities around them that don't have that 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 same representation, right? And so, right. Um, you know, the one, you know, one last thought too, I think to Barry's point about you know, making sure that we talk to. Oh, Ashley. And, and, you know, our legislators about what year, um, in particular, I think is key and critical is that, you know, you know, for me, you know, the, um, you know, I think that, the, you know, most important is that, you know, you know, inevitably, I mean, and in, in many, many redistricting processes in our state, there have been lawsuits. And so folks have to think about all of the different tools that people and community have as well. Like, and so the, the transparency has grown, but also too, the tools in the toolbox have grown. And I think even when Section 5 existed, we had lawsuits. And I think that, you know, if we don't end up where we need to be, we'll see that tool being employed as well. And then what does that mean for the timeline? And, you know, and I think that, you know, we're, we're all, you know, kind of just, you know, I'm, you know, I'm hopeful and, um, and, you know, and want to make sure too that, you know, Norby, you're absolutely correct. Like we, this is about, you know, the, you know, the 4.5 million people that live in our state, you know, and so how are we making sure that they all, you know, um, are represented and have voice. And so, no, I'm, I'm, I'm excited and, 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 ho and hopeful. One last shout out real quick to the staff. I mean, they, they're gonna be the guardrails in this whole thing, given how many new members we have. Even though we had a tremendous amount of experience last go round, they really buoyed us. I'm so grateful to have, you know, Yolanda running the Senate staff and, you know, Trish Lowry is a guru of gurus, but, you know, the, um, I'll save it for another day. I know, I know we're running out of time. <laughs> I know, but no, I agree. The staff's amazing, the staff's amazing. Yep. They are, and often the staff is what saves us all. Um, so panelists, <laughs> thank you so much. We The staff saves the faculty at universities too, just so you know. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, I know we've learned a lot and we really appreciate your perspectives. Um, it's funny that you mentioned tools, Ashley, because we're moving on to uh, Stephen Kearney, who is the co-director of Fair Districts Louisiana. He's going to share um, a little bit about some mapping tools that are available so that uh, we can all draw our own maps. So with that, I will turn it over to Stephen Kearney. Thanks, Janae. Um, and thank you to everyone here for uh, taking some time out of their day to make themselves a more, uh, uh, a more uh, informed citizen. Um, as you may know, democracy is on a pretty precipitous decline worldwide. Um, the number of countries that can be classified as democracies is decreasing and 
of the countries that are democracies, many have experienced democratic backsliding in such a way that they're now categorized as flawed democracies instead of full democracies. Um, unfortunately, the United States is one of the countries that is now considered a flawed democracy. And a significant reason for that is that our political districts are too often drawn in a way that lead to elected bodies that are not representative of the underlying populace. Um, luckily, since we're in a redistricting year, we have a, the opportunity to do something about this. And that's especially true because for the first time ever, the data and tools that were once available only to a select few are now available to everyone for like little or no cost. Um, so any concerned citizen has the ability to engage in the redistricting process, including by creating their own maps using one of the many public map, make, map, make, map making tools that now exist. And there are many such tools around, but my favorite one is Dave's redistricting app and it's Dave's app that I'm gonna show you a little bit of now. So with that being said, I'm gonna go share my screen. <clears throat> and get going. All right. Can everyone see? Oh, there it is. Okay. Okay. Um, now, since I only have 10 minutes, the first thing I'd like to do is to point you to the many tutorials uh, the authors of the site have created. So even if you've never created political maps before, there's all the information you need to become a citizen map maker. And it's just medium.com slash DRA 2020. It has everything you need about getting started in DRA, building your own district map, and, and going on and on. So now that you know that that exists, I'll uh, show you some of the essential features of the site. So what I love about Dave's redistricting app is that it combines all of these disparate data sources that you need to properly analyze a map. It has racial and demographic data from the census. Right now it was 2010 data, but it will soon have uh, 2020 data when that's released. Um, it has population updates from the American Community Survey. It has years of voting behavior data from the Secretary of State website. It has the 2020 geometric shapes that official map makers will be using this time around. Um, and it includes, it uses all the data that, that it's combined to calculate certain metrics about maps that, that, are, that exist and that are trying to be created. So for instance, if you create a count, you'll see that there are the LA 2020, there are all the official maps that are currently in effect. And so that's something you can use to build off of. And it, it, it calculates certain analytics about, um, about the official maps and maps that people create. So if you click on analytics right here, it um, shows normalized scores for five different standards of fairness. And so it, um, it has competitiveness, which is the likelihood of, uh, of any one party winning an election, uh, partisan proportionality, which is the degree to which an elected body uh, is proportional to the um, partisan preferences of the citizens, the, the degree to which it splits underlying uh, elector, uh, existing um, political districts, compactness, which is more about the shapes and minority representation. And so any map that you create, it will calculate all of these scores um, and normalize it on a zero to 100 scale where zero is worse and 100 is better. Also, it'll um, tell you if it meets basic requirements such that um, it be complete, contiguous, free of holes and have equal population. <clears throat> Moving on, you also have the ability to create a blank map from the map section. So if you uh, create an account, you can just create a new map. You can name it. Click which state. And um, for instance, say you want to create a congressional map uh, with the 2020 precincts. All you have to do is click apply. And it will create a blank map for you. Oop. To which you can use the painting tool and start assigning districts. And as you start assigning precincts to districts, it will automatically update these statistics um, and show where you are in terms of creating districts of equal population and whatever partisan mean, uh, whatever partisan lean you want, as well as demographics. I mean, obviously we have 3000 precincts in the state and many, many more census blocks. So a better, another option you might wanna do is to create a map from an existing map. And so say you like some things about our current state Senate map, but you wanted to um, change some things about it. All you have to do is pull up the official map 
click made it make an editable copy of this map click yes and you have your own official copy of the state senate map which you can then um, uh, make edits to <clears throat> and so i'll just show like for instance say you wanted to change this one to another one all you have to do is click this and now bam it is it is changed to this other district <clears throat> And once you and once you finish your map that um, that you've created, you have the ability to publish it so that other people can see it. <clears throat> and finally, you have the ability to import uh, maps from other sources. You know, there are a lot of like algorithms that create maps, or there may be some uh, official maps that have not been uploaded yet. So, for instance, uh, when I created my account, I noticed that the existing Bez, uh, Board of Elementary and Secondary Education, Public Service Commission, and, and State Supreme Courts had not been updated yet. And so I just downloaded the block assignment files from uh, from the Secretary of State website, uploaded it, and published them. And now these are available for anyone to use. And finally, um, the last thing I wanted to show you is that uh, you know there's a lot of attention on state and congressional redistricting, but I mean a lot of local activists. You can really have more of an impact with local redistricting, and so. You can also do a local registering with this tool and it shows you how um, you just basically create a subset of the map and then you can just publish a map just uh, just like any other map. So that's something I wanted to show you too. And um, that's just kind of an overview of Dave's registering app. Um, I think we have a couple more minutes if anybody has any questions about it. <clears throat> pretty, pretty cool tool, isn't it? <clears throat> oh, I have some questions in the chat. Hold up. <clears throat> okay, so the question was, um, do precincts track with census tracks? Um, there is a way to break down the voting behavior data into census tracks. And so um, what, what you can do is take, for instance, the partisan lean of uh, the partisan lean of a given precinct, and it will break it down into different census blocks. Um, so it definitely has the capability of doing that, yes. Um, where the maps go. So you can keep the maps on uh, Dave's Redistricting app and make them viewable by the public, or you can also export them. So um, say I have this map and I wanna share it. You can export it as a block assignment file, as a precinct assignment file. You can, um, you can export the, the district shapes and, and the image of the map and everything. So. You can either leave this as just the URL and just give people the URL, or you can export all of this to whatever tool you want to use. <clears throat> I'd be happy to give it a, a full tutorial, but um, like I said, uh, also the this Days of Districting Medium site has a lot of great tutorials too. But we'll definitely um, Fair District of Louisiana will definitely be giving a tutorial as well. <clears throat> and there's actually the day from Dave's redistricting is actually here and he's saying in the chat that they have a bunch of YouTube videos as well, which I love. Thank you for dialing in. He is an excellent coder, no doubt. So you want, somebody wants to look at the analytics. Oh yeah. Yeah, oh. share. So someone wanted to see the actual um, measures for compactness. Um, so the actual measures are called the REOC and uh, Polsey Popper uh, scales. And one measures how dispersed the district shapes are and one measures how indented the district shapes are. And these are combined um, into a single uh, normalized measure from zero to 100. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, let's see. In a sense, there are some are more problematic. And so um, the BESI and judicial maps have not been redrawn uh, for a couple of decades. And so they're definitely very malapportioned. And so there's a lot of talk about people wanting to ensure that BESI, PSC, and state Supreme Court and state courts of appeal are redrawn this time around. And so that's definitely something we're going to be advocating for. <clears throat> And that's all I had. Thank you so much for your attention, guys. Great. Thank you, Stephen. Okay, now we are going to move forward to the second panel. I'm Melissa Flournoy. Uh, I'm a former legislator. I represented Shreveport in North Louisiana in the early 90s. And so we're going to take a walk down memory lane uh, with Jay Darden on some issues we've dealt with on redistricting for the last four cycles. The folks we have in our second panel are the Commissioner of Administration, Jay Darden, um, State Representative Barry Ivey, and State Representative Royce DePlessis. And so we've talked a little bit about congressional redistricting in the first panel. Um, and I think it's important to know that Louisiana had eight congressional districts until 1980. Between 1980 and 2011, we had seven districts. In 2012, we went down to six districts, and we may not lose a district in this redistricting, but Louisiana is one of the only states in the country that has a negative population growth and an out-migration. And so uh, one of the things to consider as we move forward uh, around congressional redistricting is that potentially, if not this year, and the next 10-year cycle, we could uh, lose another redistricting seat. So at this time, I would like to recognize our panelists. Uh, I'm going to start with you, Commissioner Darden. If you would just give us a brief update on your personal background and your experience in redistricting uh, very briefly, and then we'll go to uh, Representative DePlessis and then Representative Ivey. Sure, Melissa, thank you. Um, in, a, in a past life, I was very, very involved in these redistricting questions. I was in the state Senate. Uh, in, in the latter part of the 1990s and the first part of the 2000s, I served on the Senate Governmental Affairs Committee. I chaired that committee during the uh, 1990s when uh, the congressional redistricting was, was from 1990 was still a major issue. Um, so I, I've watched this closely through the years. I don't have any direct contact with it now, but during my time as Secretary of State, obviously uh, elections and, and matters related to elections were a big part of, of my uh, to-do list as well. Well, we appreciate you being with us, Jay, because you, you bring a, a great historical perspective. Um, next, we'll have Representative Royce DuPlessis. Royce, would you introduce yourself? Thank you, Melissa, and thank you to uh, all of you just for inviting me to be a part of this important conversation. It has been stated several times, obviously, uh, that most of us who are going to be involved in this redistricting process have not participated in it prior. So certainly glad to be on a panel with my good friend and colleague, Representative Ivy, as well as uh, Commissioner Darden, someone who has had some experience in doing this. But uh, I'm excited about the process that'll be coming up. I currently serve as Vice Chair of the House and Governmental Affairs Committee. So uh, we'll be intimately involved in this process once it begins. And I'm looking forward to the conversation and trying not to be too repetitive based on what's been already said from the prior two panels. But uh, this is uh, about as important of a discussion that I can think of and certainly one that I'm looking forward to um, not only adding to the conversation, but, but, but taking from the conversation. And to all of those who are on the call that I haven't um, met yet, look forward to working with you. I represent um, District 93 in New Orleans. So, um, Proud to, proud to be in the legislature during this time. Thank you. Great. And uh, Representative Ivey? Yes, uh, uh, Barry Ivey. Uh, this is my third term uh, as a House member. This is my second term on House and Governmental. Uh, I thoroughly enjoy House and Governmental just because of the uh, breadth of subject matters that it uh, has to deal with. And of course, Redistricting isn't one of those subjects that I would necessarily say is uh, going to be one of those fun ones, but it's absolutely critical to our um, our process. And uh, and again, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and speak. You know, earlier 
um, it was said, you know, the, the tremendous amount of, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, how much we're going to have to rely on staff to produce, you know, help guide us through this process because uh, because of term limits, we there is really no experience, you know, from a, a legislative perspective. So we're going to have to rely on staff uh, tremendously to help, you know, provide us uh, the you know the information. We have demographers who have been working and will continue to work at the Capitol to help, uh, you know, uh, produce the data as soon as the feds, uh, you know, give us the data. But uh, anyway, it's a it's a critical process, and I do believe that the transparency and accountability that um, we operate in is uh, going to be critical. Well, thank you for being with us today. Um, Jay, I want to come to you and sort of talk about one of the issues that Ashley raised based on population of where we are here in Louisiana with about 38% minority population. You can make a case that we probably do uh, should warrant having a second minority district, but can you talk a little bit about the compromise of 1991 that created a second minority district when Cleo Fields was elected and the level of uh, gerrymandering that were involved was involved to sort of create that Zorro district. Yeah, I'll, I'll try. That's a ancient history from my standpoint, but I'll, I'll we'll give it a whirl. Um, the the ninety census, the population back then did justify potentially having two black districts, majority minority districts. The district that was drawn for Senator Fields. Uh, was what was called the Z district, the Zorro district. And, and by the way, I did not hear the earlier discussions. I apologize. So I hope I'm not going to be too repetitive with what came up earlier. But uh, that district was, was clearly gerrymandered. It was uh, of great concern. It wound up in litigation literally for most of the 90s because by the time we resolved uh, that, that district ultimately was in the latter half of the 1990s. And I was chairman of the Senate Governmental Affairs Committee at the time. So um, it was, it was, eventually thrown out and a new plan was, was written. Um, it's going to be, I think, politically speaking, uh, very difficult, if not impossible, to have a second majority minority district now in the current configuration that we have with a fewer number of, of representatives and with a Republican majority that, that is present in both houses of the legislature. But um, that's obviously going to be a, a, a key uh, area of concern. You're going to be looking at, at pure politics, Republican, Democrat politics, you're going to be looking at race uh, and you're going to be looking at geography. Those are the three main factors that are going to be determinants in drawing these congressional districts. And all that will, will factor in as well to, to redrawing the legislative districts. And this is a little bit beyond your question, but a le legislative district redrawing, I, I've described it as uh, political, personal, and persnickety. And that's, it'll, it'll never change as long as we do it the way we do it, because it's obviously very personal to those elected officials who are the very ones who are deciding where the lines are drawn. And they're looking at their own districts. They're looking at their future political plans, be it to move from the House to the Senate or to move to a congressional district. Uh, and all those factors play into uh, falling within the legal guidelines that are out there regarding uh, how uh, how districts are drawn. And, and now well, the landscape has changed dramatically right now than when it was several decades ago with a new series of court decisions and, and other factors uh, politically, nationally, they're going to have a big bearing on, on this whole redistricting issue. Well, one, thank you, Jay. One of the things that we got in the, in the first section was the uh, it's, uh, so you've got the fourth and the fifth district. Julia Letlow was just uh, elected uh, to the uh, fifth district. Um, there's been some interest historically from Shreveport to have a North Louisiana I-20 district. There's been interest from Monroe to keep two districts. Um, do you have any ideas about uh, the appropriateness of this cycle around a North Louisiana district? And do you see, how do you predict uh, any, if there'll be any major changes in redistricting for the congressional districts? Well, like, like Yogi Bear said, I never make predictions, particularly about the future. And so I don't know that I wanna make a prediction as to what'll happen on, on the redrawing of those lines, but it'll be a major uh, point of discussion and contention because clearly from a geographical standpoint, you can create a, a very consistent uh, district across I-20 and just, basically carve out North Louisiana as a district unto itself that is lo losing population, relatively speaking, to the South. 
um, and, and then draw lines throughout the South that, that are also more compact and, and more contiguous and make more sense than, than some of the uh, gerrymandering that has to take place. So that's a very logical argument that can be made. I, I believe there has been traditionally a difference between Shreveport and Monroe, basically each metropolitan area wanting to elect their own person. And, and that's what's driven a lot of that discussion. Um, and it'll, it'll drive that discussion again. And in situation with Julia having just been elected and being brand new, um, there'll be political factors there as well regarding uh, how those lines may be drawn. And I heard Norby at the end of that last presentation, there's always been a lot of discussion around the, uh, the South Louisiana area as well, how you have to carve those areas up, particularly in legislative districts, not so much in the congressional district. But I think that geographical de debate will be a big part of what we see when it comes time to redraw the congressional lines. Well, um, thank you for that. I do feel like the geography, the desire of South Louisiana to have potentially more compact districts, particularly for Congress, you know, uh, uh, what was the Bayou region? Now you've got Garrett Graves district going all the way down to Homa Thibodeau. So, you know, there are issues around uh, how best to draw those lines. This is a question for, for you, Royce, to follow up on the issue of racial proportionality, which is always a consideration in redistricting. And many of the current maps come up short on creating a second uh, minority district. And um, some of the issues around that have to do with the issues that Ashley raised around compactness, contiguity, sort of decisions that are made around how, what percentage of voters of a particular race, whether uh, need to be in a particular district through court through packing or fracking of the those districts. And so how important is it to you that we increase the racial proportionality in the state's political maps? And how how optimistic or not optimistic are you uh, of that playing out in the redistricting process? Sure. So to the first question, I'll answer it somewhat in reverse. When you say, say how important is it that we increase racial proportionality, I, I think it's better to answer the question by stating it's most important that the districts be most reflective of the state. And if the numbers suggest that there be an increase in proportionality, then that should then follow the first priority, which is that the map should be more ref most reflective of the state. Uh, so logically, my answer to that question is it is very important because right now, based upon the numbers, and these are not final numbers based upon what we are going to get uh, later this year from the feds, but we can expect to see numbers in, I guess, maybe like the 38% range of non-white, okay? So if we're talking just purely from a minority standpoint. If we only have one district that represents roughly 16% of minorities throughout this state, that is problematic. And I think that is a, 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 a that needs to be top of the agenda. So whether that or not that there needs to be a second uh, majority minority district um, or med, whether that second district will be competitive, uh, like really com truly competitive for a, uh, not just a minority, but just someone who represents a, the diversity of views that this that this uh, that that particular district may represent. That is, in my opinion, very very important and and that, uh, a very much a priority for me. To the second question, in terms of how I see this all playing out, uh, I think I'll probably fall in line with most of the folks who have answered that question, especially as someone who hasn't been through the process before. Uh, it's it's hard to predict but I am going into this process with an expectation of optimism and to not let history necessarily uh, uh, dominate how we approach what can be. And I think that this is an opportunity for us as a state to say, yeah, historically, this is how things may have gone, but that doesn't necessarily mean this is how it has to go. Uh, and I've seen traditions be broken since the short period of time that I've been there in terms of uh, certain actions that the governor has taken and how he's been challenged on calling special sessions and who really uh, makes that happen. So I, I, I've been reaching out to past chair uh, chairs of, of, of this process, like President Rick Gallo, who's been through the process, and he has shared wisdom and talking with people who've been through the process. But I don't I don't think that it necessarily has to be a complete guide in terms of how it's going to be. For example, it was pointed out 
that for I think the past two redistricting cycles, we haven't touched Bessie districts or the Supreme Court districts. I think we may be breaking that tradition this go around. I think there's will be some some real um, effort being put towards those those uh, two projects. So uh, I'm 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 optimistic that we're going to have to uh, maybe do things a little bit different. And obviously, the fact that Section Five isn't in play like it was ten years ago, um, you know, we're in sort of a different climate. So I'm choosing to view it through a lens of optimism but also not being naive uh, to the points that Commissioner Dard mentioned that at the end of the day, it is a political process. So I do reala realize that as well. And um, that's gonna be a, a balance that we have to strike. Um, well, it is, it is a political process. And one of the questions in the past has been, do uh, legislators pick their voters or do voters pick their legislators? And I think that sort of plays out in redistricting yep. uh, completely. And, you know, in the first panel, no one specifically mentioned it, but we do have more community engagement. Ashley mentioned the number of crowd academies and the number of individuals that have gone through training on redistricting. Fair Districts has done a number of uh, educational forums. We'll be doing this as well as several other forums. Uh, the legislature uh, had the uh, considered creating an independent commission in the last legislative session or creating a website. So this is a question for you, Representative Ivey. Um, the US Congress is currently considering a bill, HR1 and now Senate 1, that could potentially have an enormous impact on the way states do redistricting. What are your thoughts on that federal measure and how could it shape the redistricting process in Louisiana? And sort of what's your, and what's your sense of the political reality here in Louisiana in terms of transparency and citizen engagement? Well, I, thank you. I appreciate the easy question, uh, the, the 900 page bill. <laughs> so uh, I haven't fully digested it, okay? I will say that um, I have great concerns about uh, what what's in there. I do have concerns over, you know, what, what has historically been a, kind of in my mind, a more of a state's rights issue as far as the state legislatures controlling the process. Um, there may be room um, for, uh, you know, certain standards and, and things like that for the feds to, uh, you know, kind of mandate. But I, I'm concerned about the depth and breadth of the um, that that, you know, H.R. one um, intends. It seems to tend to go, um, you know, election integrity and election security are it's, it's the first thing that we have to ensure. And I, and this isn't a political thing. I uh, have a great deal of respect for my uh, colleagues, um, uh, you know, Democrat and Republican alike, where it's something I think we all believe is very important. Um, and, you know, there's been legislation on voter ID stuff and where I, I supported, I believe, Royce, you carried that bill, correct, on voter ID? And, and so uh, through conversation and, and information, we realized, you know what, you know, student IDs on college campuses are sufficient. Um, and so, uh, you know, there, it's a learning process all the time, but I believe that, you know, we do have to maintain a focus on election integrity and election security. I believe through technology and processes that we can help, we can modernize uh, the voting system in different ways, but I, we have to have that. I think some of that has to come first before we get certain mandates. I mean, I believe same day registration is possible. We just need the technological uh, you know, uh, solutions to help provide for those types of uh, things. And if, as long as we can provide for election integrity and election security, then, um, the, you know, I believe we should be able to open up and expand and make as absolutely convenient as possible, um, you know, the participation of our citizens to vote. Well, thank you for your comments. Um, so this, this is a question I get, and I'll start with you, Jay. Um, around uh, engagement of the public and transparency. We've got more opportunity now with technology for people to draw their own districts. We've done road shows in the past. Um, what recommendations do you have for how uh, nonprofit groups, citizens, individuals can uh, connect with the redistricting process at the Capitol 
uh, and what advice would you give based on, on your experience? Well, hopefully by the time the legislature convenes in a special session to address these redistricting issues, the pandemic will be largely behind us and, and we can return to what's been missing over the course of the past year and that is real engagement by the public. I mean, it's been very disconcerting to go through the legislative session last year and not really have the ability to, to have the input of the public being physically present and actually participating in the debate and committee. So I think that's going to be a very important component of the redistricting debate is, is opening things back up so that people can participate. Um, and I think back 20 years ago when, when we were looking at redistricting and computers didn't exist, we didn't have computers, we didn't have what we have now to do these lines. Uh, those who did the work had computers and, and it was amazing to me that they could go redraw the lines just with a touch of a button. Now, we all have the ability to do that on our home computers and what you saw from Mr. Kearney's presentation, how advanced it is now and how uh, simpler it is than what it used to be. So I think that is going to encourage a lot of people who are uh, sophisticated enough to use those kind of programs to to weigh in on what they think is a better way to do it. I think that's going to probably make the legislator's job more challenging because there's the potential for a lot more people having more suggestions and more thoughts on what these districts ought to look like. And that's not a bad thing as far as I'm concerned. Concern. Um, we're one of, I think, 32 states that still has the legislature redrawing the lines and, and that whole discussion about whether to have a commission is something that's not going to go away as we move forward because I think people feel like an independent commission, though it can never be truly independent and non-political, is certainly less political than a legislative body that, that has an inevitable self-interest in, in drawing some of those lines. So I think that discussion will probably continue, although we won't have a commission this year to, um, to redraw lines. It'll be done by the legislature. Well, is it possible for the governor to do an executive order to create a redistricting commission or would that not have, and it would not have the force of law, but could be a way to bring more people into the conversation? I mean, what I, do you think, think about that, that idea? I think that could be done, but it does not have the force of law and it would not supplant the legislature's actual authority to redraw the line. So I'm not sure how much power, or how much deference would be given to a, a commission like that. And obviously, anytime you talk about a commission, you talk about a constitutional convention, the question is who are the people who are gonna be making it up? It's mm. inevitably gonna be political to some extent, and there will always be people saying, well, if the governor created by executive order a, a um, commission, well, then he's chosen who he wants to be on there, so it's stilted in a way that he would like to see it, as opposed to something created legislatively that you could argue at least had the blessing of the entirety of the legislature. So um, stay tuned on this issue, because I think as we move forward society, in society, we're going to continue to have these discussions. Well, Representative DuPlessis, I think it was Amy Freeman who brought the um, redistricting commission bill last year and talked about an official website and other transparency. So, and I haven't gone through all of the pre-filed bills, but do you know if there's any legislation that's been filed on uh, the redistricting process so far for this session? Oh. Kelsey, I don't think Royce has got his, he's muted by someone. There you go. Okay. Yeah, I was, I, as you were asking me the question, I was trying to unmute and it wouldn't let me. Okay. But, um, but thank you for All the right, question. Sorry about that. Um, I'm not aware of anything that's been filed yet or that will be filed. As you mentioned, uh, this effort was made last go round to create the, uh, the independent commission. It, it did not get much support, didn't make it out of committee, unfortunately. Um, Sort of like Commissioner Darden just mentioned, look, personally, I'll, I'll tell you where I am with that. I, I do think it is a it is a good step. If we had the opportunity to create one, I would I am personally in favor of, of seeing something like that happen. But even if we were as a state to choose to go down that path, I, I don't think it removes the, the the politics from it, because then the question is, well, who will have the influence to appoint these people? Uh, and, and that will that in and of itself can become uh, an entirely, um, you know, just messy process too. So I don't know that you, you you fully guard yourself, or we would fully guard ourselves from the inevitable, which is the folks who are charged with drawing the lines right now, the legislators, from still having that influence. It may create another uh, layer, but I think that's why the public participation aspect of this is so crucial. So just like we're able to have this discussion via Zoom, 
this probably requires less resources in some respect to, to get state participation in real time uh, that may not involve as much or have as much of a burden on some communities to be able to share their perspectives. But certainly last session we saw with COVID just the lack of, of, of citizen involvement and citizen engagement. We hope to be in a better position when these the discussions actually do begin. I'm personally in favor of going on a road show. I wanna do that. I wanna do those things that were done before, go to certain communities throughout the state to have that participation because even if we don't have independent commissions set up, the public still has to have us have a say in this and the public has to be engaged and they have to hold us electeds accountable. So I don't see it, I honestly don't see it happening this go around, but, uh, but that shouldn't lessen the level of involvement and uh, public input that, that we have. Well, I, I appreciate that. And, and chances are we won't be able to have an independent commission, but uh, it would be interesting if the legislature would consider Zoom testimony uh, at various committees or more virtual engagement. I think Commissioner right. Darden is right. Um, the building is, was virtually empty last year and you've got a whole lot of new legislators that have really not had that gauntlet experience of you know, having a thousand people, uh, you know, in the Capitol on a daily basis. So, um, you know, how do we bring more people into the process, I think is one of the, well, and that's sort of an issue, um, uh, Representative Ivy around one of the issues that's being considered now, I think legislatively, there was a committee that came out with a question around party primaries. And so, you know, we've gerrymandered our congressional districts as such that we've got one minority district and five majority Republican districts that are, are fairly consistent that a, a Republican will win those congressional districts. And so in the past decade, um, these races really have been won or lost in the primaries. And so uh, do you favor uh, closed party primaries and or are there other ways that you think might make these congressional elections more competitive? Well, uh, more competitive, that, that's kind of a hard, hard uh, task uh, to make something competitive. Uh, we just at the legislative level, uh, we have many legislators, myself included, uh, who run unopposed. We have had vacant seats where there was no opposition. So before you get to the, the, the idea that uh, we have to make something competitive. I think we first have to understand that politics today is a is a is a is a level of sacrifice and also just the the, the difficulty surrounding getting anything accomplished, particularly in D.C., is not something that I think most people you know uh, would uh, would really want to uh, gravitate towards naturally. And so there's challenges there. With regard to a, a race, it, you know, incumbents uh, have an advantage, uh, clearly, um, the, the, the numbers reflect that. And so, uh, you know, there's the timing of, of people getting in, you know, to genuinely be able to challenge, uh, you know, have a competitive race. Uh, you know, a vacant seat certainly uh, provides more opportunity than uh, someone running for reelection. And so I think these are some of the challenges that regardless of how districts are drawn, uh, I think this is just something that is historically um you know, been the case. And so those are challenges. I don't know specifically how to overcome those to, you know, force, you know, competitiveness. But, um, you know, I, I don't know if uh, closed primaries uh, offers uh, is, is the silver bullet for that. You know, personally, I, I have concerns about just because Louisiana, we have so many uh, uh, voters who are registered as uh, no party or independent, you know, how we address uh, voter participation in a, in a, closed party primary when so many voters don't identify with you know the two major parties is a concern of mine and I, I've, I've not seen something that um, gives me a high degree of confidence that um, you know voter participation and uh, is not going to be um, hindered you know in uh, in a closed party primary um, I, I appreciate that comment now Kelsey we have time for one question from the chat do you have a question uh, that uh, has come up in the chat that you'd like us to address? Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, the question from the chat is, how involved do the panelists believe the governor will be in redistricting giving, given that he has veto power? 
Great. Well, let's let's use that as our wrap up question, and we'll go down the line. So, Commissioner Darden, we'll start with you. My sense is that he will will be involved to the extent that he does have veto authority. I think he'll let the legislators uh, do their job and and draw lines. And if he thinks the lines are drawn appropriately, then the bill will get signed. If not, uh, he always has the veto right. Uh, my my guess is he'll he'll probably have minimal involvement in the process um, as it as it begins and as it comes from the legislative level. I just want to make a quick observation. Um, that that debate on closed primaries is going to take place in the regular session before they get to a redistricting session. And I think that's going to be a very divisive and very interesting debate that's going to take place. And some lines are going to get drawn from a political standpoint on whether people are for or against the closed primary looking at their own political futures. And I think that will weigh on what happens in the whole redistricting debate as well. Thank you. Thank I appreciate you. that. Uh, Representative DePlessis. Sure. I I, will, I just have to echo what was just said. I think that the governor will more likely than not let the legislature uh, sort of take the lead on this. But you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I haven't spoken to the governor or or, or his uh, or the fourth floor yet in terms of what their expectation may or may not be. But my my guess is that. They're going to just wait to see what we can do as a legislature, and he always reserves the right to uh, to veto anything that in some way harms the state or is harmful, is not reflective of the population of the state. So I can sort of take personal privilege in just saying that I'm, that, that gives me some, some comfort, just given the, the makeup of the legislature. And, you know, at the end of the day, it boils down to numbers. And, you know, my hope is that if I can't be a part of ensuring that the maps that are sent from the House and the Senate are, are, are best reflective of the state, that then we, we can make an appeal to the governor. So I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for that. Representative Ivey. Yeah, so, uh, you know, serving on the House committee, uh, I don't know if my, if my feedback is having issues or not, but anyway, serving on the House committee, I, we have good diversity um, uh, on the committee where we've got uh, all the political perspectives, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, represented and also uh, geographical representation. So I think we've got a great committee. I believe that, you know, we have a lot of work ahead of us on the committees to really introduce, you know, to and send to the floor, um, you know, good, reasonable, uh, you know, uh, drawn district uh, lines. I, I'll take uh, the commissioner's uh, uh, insights on, you know, the governor's engagement. Uh, obviously, the governor, I do believe, will, uh, you know, kind of a wait and see. I believe he respects the process. You know, the legislature has to do its job and he has a job to do as well. But I also trust uh, my colleagues um, to uh, work together to uh, really try to produce the best possible outcomes uh, so we have the, you know, fair representation um, throughout our state. Terrific. Well, I just want to thank all of y'all for being with us today. And I want to specifically thank panelists, uh, Ashley Shelton from the Power Coalition, Barry Irwin with the Council for Better Louisiana, former State Senator Norby Schauer, uh, Commissioner of Administration, uh, Jay Darden, Representative Plessis, and Representative Ivan. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge that there are a lot of organizations around the state very interested in redistricting, but interested in uh, having citizens represented. I want to encourage folks to look for resources on the Fair Districts website, the Power Coalition website, Louisiana Progress, and others. Uh, and I want to give a shout out to the League of Women Voters and Joyce Corrington, I saw her on, as well as CAR that has done good work, the Pelican Institute, uh, and other nonprofits that will be engaged uh, in the redistricting discussion as we move forward. And so, We'll be planning a series of summits with the uh, LSU Riley Center and Fair Districts that will bring in uh, political leaders as well as advocacy representatives and citizens over the next several months. And so we're scheduling these summits to talk about local redistricting, Bessie Board, Supreme Board. We want to make sure that citizens are informed and engaged and lift up the voices of all of our citizens. Um, we know that we just have a long-term impact uh, on who, who represents us. And so we want to encourage fairness, transparency, equity, 
uh, and representation. And we hope that this series will uh, continue as an opportunity to share knowledge with the legislators and with the public. And so uh, it is right now 12 o'clock. I want to end on time, but thank you for our panelists and our leaders in the legislature. Thank you for our citizens and representatives from other nonprofits. And uh, let's make our voices heard during this legislation uh, to make a difference. So uh, on behalf of the Riley Center, I'm Melissa Flournoy with Louisiana Progress. Uh, and I want to thank Stephen with Fair Districts. And this could be a lot of fun. We can draw some interesting maps, get a lot of people involved, and really have an impact. So thank you for being with us today.